So today's talk, we're especially glad to have Jim Bull with us. Jim is from the Regents Professor from the University of Texas, Austin. Um, I followed his work for many years, ever since his original work on sex determination mechanisms. And then he decided to make a big switch from that and instead switch to virus evolution and phages and bacteria and all of that. Um, he's been instrumental in helping us get evolution and medicine going in general. Uh, he and Steve Stearns and I had a long talk with Oxford as we were getting the journal together to make everything work, and he's been very instrumental in you know, doing his judge duties for the Omen Prize as well. Um, his research continues to look at everything from reptiles to viruses to um, especially phages. And he, he is actually in part responsible for my wish to find someone who does phage evolution here to join our center. We haven't found such a person so far, but he may advise us further about that. He was also invited to join the National Academy last year. Um, and he has new things to tell us about how different strategies might be useful in combating infections and the like. Jim, we're glad you're here. Thank you. <clears throat> so um, it's exciting for me to be here. I've never been here before. I fly through Phoenix a fair bit on my way up to Moscow, Idaho, um, <clears throat> and I'm having a really good time. Uh, there seems to be a real atmosphere of excitement here, which is hard to find at a university these days. I'm also really glad because I spent the last six weeks in Moscow, Idaho, where they've had a real winter, and in the last few days we got about six inches of snow, so here I can actually see the ground and trees and whatnot. <clears throat> um, so I'm going to talk about an area that I consider to be one of the most exciting in evolutionary biology. I can say that without um, boasting or much conflict of interest because I'm talking about work that is almost entirely not my own. Do you want me to not pace so you can track me or do you? <clears throat> um, and The actual topic for the talk, which was too long to post, um, has to do with evolution of transmissible genomes engineered for disease control. The talk's given, going to be fairly broad brush. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. It's also fairly short, so if you have any questions during the talk, just feel free to ask them. I'm going to talk about three stories. Um, two of them have to do with trying to modify insect vectors of disease. Um, they're related in some respects and not others. And the third one is about vaccine design. The only thing that these examples have in common is they're all about what we might call real-time evolution in engineering, right? So when I first started out in evolutionary biology, <clears throat> we, you know, evolution was a slow process and we never thought about actual medical relevance to it, never thought about much of any kind of relevance. And yet we're in an era now that with genome engineering where we can actually introduce interventions and we can watch evolution happen. And that's kind of the, the common theme here. So the first topic, it will be on gene drive. This is kind of an introduction to what's going on. It will be a bit about the history uh, and what, some, where, what I think the forefront is right now. So gene drive is a form of um, genetic engineering. And genetically modified organisms have been around for a long time. And so we might ask, what is all the fuss about right now? Why all the excitement? Um, and it's because it's a new type of genetic uh, engineering, new type of genetic modification. So I would guess over the last few decades, we've all seen headlines about some group has engineered mosquitoes to not transmit malaria or something like that. And the problem has always been that just because you could genetically modify something, it didn't solve the problem of how you convert a natural population, right? So what, you engineer a mosquito that doesn't transmit malaria, all the other mosquitoes out there in the wild are transmitting malaria, and somehow, if you're gonna have an effect, you gotta get your genetic engineering to take over the wild population. And so we have this headline here, which I just pulled off the web, and probably doesn't sound very favorable to genetic engineering, but, you were faced with what is said here. If you want to impact the wild population, you have to turn loose millions or billions of individuals that you've engineered to change over the wild population. Gene drive is fundamentally different in that you can 
make a genetic modification that can convert a population with a tiny infusion. So our headline would now be changed to the FDA could set instead of millions of genetically modified mosquitoes loose in Florida, dozens of them, right? You could release just a few of these and the gene drive will sweep through the population and change the population for you. Um, a very brief one slide introduction to gene drive. What is it um, from the old selfish gene perspective? We can think of it as we've engineered an allele that gives itself an unfair advantage by cheating the alternative allele in the same individual, right? So it's not doing anything good for the, the individual it's in or necessarily for the population. It's simply cheating its way to higher frequency and usually that's done by modifying segregation in its favor. <clears throat> so the usual advantage it gives itself has to do with segregation. Gene drive isn't new. These natural examples um, are some really ancient ones from your perspective. Um, the T. locus in the mouse has gene drive systems. We've known about that since the 1930s at least. L. C. Dunn did the work there. And in the 1950s, uh, in Jim Crow's lab, they discovered a system in Drosophila melanogaster called SD or segregation disorder. They've been around for a while. We've known about them. What's new is CRISPR. Um, CRISPR, I'm sure you've all heard about CRISPR. Um, it's a system that was discovered in bacteria and it's a very programmable form of DNA scissors. We can take the genes out of bacteria and put them into virtually any organism and have the, the genes cut DNA wherever we want. And so using this, any of you in this room could cre create your own um, engineered gene drive system. I've illustrated this in a very sort of colorful way, but to do this, you need to do two things, right? You need to take your CRISPR complex, which is a gene and some guide RNAs, and so I'm showing these in colored balls. We imagine this is our chromosome. You need to put it in somewhere into the chromosome that you want, and the other thing you need to do is you need to engineer it to cut at the place that it resides in the other chromosome, right? Those are the two things you need to do, and they're very doable now. CRISPR makes it easy, uh, and genetic engineering makes it easy. So how this works <coughs> is very simple. You, you end up, you start with a heterozygote, right? One chromosome comes in carrying CRISPR, the other doesn't. CRISPR sees that region, it cuts it. Now you have loose ends, the cell doesn't like loose ends. The cell wants to repair it, well, it uses the other chromosome as a template to repair it. And so now, whereas you didn't have a CRISPR here, the cell repairs it, so you do. So you took an individual that was heterozygous and you turned it into an effective homozygote for it. And that's all there is to it. Um, <clears throat> now that might sound innocent enough, uh, but part of the reason for the excitement and the concerns right now have to do with the fact that gene drive systems can be used to suppress populations, right? You can set them up so they don't, but you can set them up so they do. The recipe is simply that you insert CRISPR into an essential gene such that one copy somatically is enough for the individual to behave normally. Um, but you set it in there, it's going to cut there, and you, ex you set it up so that the CRISPR system is expressed only in the germline. So now when a heterozygote is formed, it'll transmit as a homozygote, but it still has one copy of the essential gene um, somatically, so it's okay. And the theory for this, they didn't know about CRISPR and that, but, the th but you can show with relatively simple theory that if you have a perfect CRISPR system, one that always converts the heterozygote into a homozygote, transmits only CRISPR um, chromosomes, you have a perfect system like that, you express it in one sex, males or females, the thing will sweep to fixation, it will knock out 50% of the population when it goes to fixation. Half the population will die. If you express it in both sexes, it'll go to fixation and it'll cause extinction of the population. That's the math. The math was worked out in the late 1950s. Tim Prout, some of you may have heard of, um, wrote I think the first paper on it. Someone else named Brooke wrote a second paper and Dick Lewinton had a paper on it back then as well. 
So that's where we're coming from. That's the pos uh, what we're interested in. Um, and again, these natural examples that were discovered back then have this property. They show that the math is by and large, right? Because in the T locus, the alleles with strong drive that occur naturally are also recessive lethals, and it was the same for segregation disorder in Drosophila. In fact, these things didn't go to fixation there. There are enough suppressors in the population that they didn't. But this is sort of where the theory came from. We knew that these odd alleles were out there. They had this weird property. We've got um, recessive lethals segregating at really high frequency. They're impacting the population. They were trying to make sense of how could this be, because recessive lethals you know, should drop out of the population. But they realized mathematically that the segregation distortion advantage compensated for it. So all that's in, been in place for quite some time. Um, and there was a gene drive extinction experiment done in the 1970s. Right? This was before we could do any genetic engineering. This was done by Terry Little, who started out in Jim Crow's lab. And he was actually testing an idea of Bill Hamilton's that was published in 67, which said that if you have a Y chromosome with segregation distortion advantage, right, that you could cause a population to go extinct. So back 40 years ago, Terry Little is doing this. Can't, you know, order up oligos or anything like that. You can't order up plasmids to be synthesized. What he did was he took advantage of the segregation disorder in Drosophila melanogaster, and he irradiated the hell out of a lot of flies, and he eventually found something that had the Y chromosome inherit, co-inherited with segregation disorder in Drosophila, and then he set up population cages. This is from one of his cages, published in the first paper on this. Um, and in blue, we have the sex ratio, so this is a gene drive experiment. He set it up, I uh, got the flies um, through irradiation, and you know, they recombine in bizarre ways, but the system behaved as he wanted. Sex ratio started out somewhere around 50%, and just according to theory, evolved up to all males. The population size fluctuated, but when the sex ratio got extreme, it went extinct. The population disappeared. So. Again, supporting the theory 40 years ago. So here we are. Where we're sitting right now is we got the possibility to put these things into almost any species we want. It's both exciting and it's scary. It's exciting because if you have a mosquito that transmits some nasty virus like Aedes aegypti, can transmit Zika, it can transmit dengue, it can transmit chicken gun. It's called the yellow fever mosquito. In theory, we could engineer a gene drive system to knock these populations out. And I'm going to say why that might not be so simple, but that's the exciting part. And you know, if you're um, government of Vietnam or whatever, and you're looking at hun you know tens to hundreds of millions of people getting sick each year from these mosquitoes, uh, we're talking about a huge impact on your your healthcare system. There, the scary part is. We don't, you know, once we release these things, we may not be able to control them any longer, right? DNA jumps around, the mariner transposable element comes out of nowhere. We have no idea how it moves around, but it jumps huge taxonomic boundaries. If we introduce one of these gene drive systems and it jumps into a pollinator species, we have the potential to wipe out a pollinator that could be really critical to um, agriculture and, some, and the food supply in some country. So. That's kind of the backdrop of this thing. Um, what I think the forefront is lies here, that really asking the questions of whether these systems are going to work the way we expect. How long, how likely is long-term population suppression? Maybe we've kind of inflated how exciting and scary this whole thing is. This is my view of things. It's kind of up in the air, but the issue is the evolution of suppressors. The math also tells us, just like the math says, if we introduce a gene drive system and let it go, it'd cause extinction or knock out half the population. But the math also says that selection will favor all sorts of suppressors of gene drive, is provided they're unlinked to the drive. And we saw that with Terry Little's work. So his first paper was about the population cages that actually went extinct. His next two papers were about cages that didn't go extinct. So the orange line up here 
um, is kind of the baseline for where he started to control. Some lines that didn't go extinct, you see the sex ratio in the cages went down, not very impressively, but enough to keep, these are all different endpoints of cages, uh, went down, you know, enough that the population could survive. This was another one that went down even more through the evolution of suppressors. Um, these were standard kind of polygenic suppressors, he thought. And then he actually had one cage, and this, by the way, is weeks of the experiment. He had one cage that evolved some bizarre attached X system, I think it was, uh, multiple sex chromosomes, such that the gene drive, the Y chromosome drive, no longer caused a problem for things. And um, you can see the sex ratio was way down there. So here, in just a small number of population cages with a thousand, a population size of a thousand flies, you're getting a variety of suppressors evolving. So if we release something like this into the wild where they're, you know, we're looking at perhaps billions of mosquitoes, we would expect suppressions almost certain to uh, evolve. And CRISPR, I think, is a bit of a double-edged sword. It's, it's very convenient in terms of programmability, but that's probably its Achilles heel because we know that um, in order to cut, it requires a match between a guide RNA and a target sequence. So the, if the target sequence evolves at all, it isn't going to cut anymore. They've found CRISPR blocking proteins and phage already. Um, so those things can evolve. And we also might imagine that microRNAs and repressors of CRISPR expression can evolve easily as well. This is all guesswork at this point. But I think this is the frontier where things are going in a paper that I this is one of the few places in this talk where I've done something, but I've done some theory on this. And in addition, you can show that if you have a lethal gene drive system uh, and there's genetic variation in the population for inbreeding, inbreeding will evolve to block the gene drive. So I think things can potentially come out of the woodwork everywhere when we introduce these systems. And it has the potential to shut the whole thing down. So I say the take home message is don't expect miracles but some utility is likely possible. That's guesswork, right? This is, I think, where you know, I'd be diving into right now if I had any time left in my career. <clears throat> Second example is somewhat related to this. We're talking about block blocking viral transmissions in mosquitoes using a symbiont. The funding for this came out of the Gates Foundation. Um, <clears throat> and there's quite a bit of funding to the tunes of tens of millions of dollars. Um, the main person involved, and I have nothing to do with this, I, I know the person on the next slide, but the main PI in all of this, the person who came up with the idea is Scott O'Neill, who's an Australian. Uh, this is uh, my friend and the one who's kept me informed about this, Michael Torelli. It looks like he's trying out for a role in The Hobbit here in this shot. I'm not sure why I got this picture from him. but. Um, and what they're aiming for here, and I found out today that um, you guys have to worry about this, is they're targeting mosquitoes that transmit dengue virus, right? Aedes aegypti, I guess it's found here, it's found across the southern U.S. Um, this is the yellow fever mosquito. It not only transmits dengue, as I said, but Zika, um, chikungunya, and so on. And that's what they were going after from the start. Now, they're not trying to kill the mosquito in this case. They're not trying to suppress its population. The symbiont is a bacterium called Wolbachia. It is, if you haven't heard of it, it is one of the most remarkable organisms on the face of the planet. It is found in something like half of all insect species, right, where it transmits itself selfishly. It's found in nematodes, it's some nematodes, it's found in arachnids. Um, it is not yet found in Aedes aegypti. It does occur in another vector of dengue called Aedes albopictus. Um, I'll talk about that very briefly at some point, but we're gonna focus on, on Aedes aegypti. Now, they're talking about moving this thing into Aedes aegypti, where it doesn't occur yet, and I'll explain why in a minute. But a key thing here is that Wolbachia acts a bit like a gene drive. You infect a few mosquitoes, mozzies is what the Australians call them. Um, you release them, and as I'll say in a minute, if you release them in sufficient density, Wolbachia does the rest. It'll spread, right? So that's why it's a good thing where you don't need to overwhelm the mosquito population. Wolbachia can kind of spread itself. Um, 
This is some work from Michael Torelli and Ari Hoffman where they were looking at the spread of Wolbachia, not in mosquitoes, but in Drosophila simulans in California over a two year period. So this is 1990. The fraction of the pie that's black is the level of Wolbachia they're seeing in the flies. And if you focus on the northern part of the state, you see there's very little here in 1990. Two years later, it's over 50%. They estimate that Wolbachia was spreading to the tune of 100 kilometers per year in this system. Now that's Drosophila. Oh, and one other point, you can forget about this. Um, it figures into something in a small way, but most of the time when you release Wolbachia, I said it can spread by itself, but to get it to do that, um, you have to get it above some particular unstable equilibrium, right? There's a certain density dependent effect you got to get above that density, and then it'll take off. If it doesn't get above that density, it'll die out. That's a property that's actually kind of useful in limiting its spread, but um, I'll come back to that in a moment. <clears throat> the project. So this is actually O'Neill's brilliance here, right? And it's risky as hell. The whole project was... The work done on Wolbachia, they knew Wolbachia was in some mosquitoes and that, and they'd use it for sighting plasmic incompatibility, but in terms of the actual biology that people were figuring out, almost all of it had been done in flies, Drosophila, right? And he made the bold assumption that what was true of Wolbachia in flies would also be true of Wolbachia in mosquitoes, that you could study the properties of Wolbachia in, in a Drosophila, you could take that Wolbachia out and you could put it in a mosquito and it would have the same property, right? And if, you know, if you're a biologist, you'd think, what the hell, because um, biology usually doesn't work that way. It did in this case. So O'Neill's first plan was to, and this was the one that was funded by Gates, was to introduce a life-shortening Wolbachia. The Wolbachia is called popcorn strain, um, and it was known from flies that it had a particular property that it shortened the lifespan of females a little bit, not per male. I guess that's somewhat profound, but it didn't kill them outright. They lived long enough to reproduce. It just cut the tail off um, on survival. So this is a survival curve from some, I guess, that paper. Um, and we have the percent of flies surviving to a certain age. These two were strains that either never had Wolbachia or that were cured with antibiotics of Wolbachia. This is one with the popcorn strain of Wolbachia in it, and you can see that females are dying a bit faster. Not all Wolbachia do this, right? This is a very specific strain that was known from flies, and that's the one that O'Neill wanted to put into mosquitoes. Why? <clears throat> because dengue needs a long time to mature inside the mosquito. So if I've got dengue, and an Aedes bites me, and then it's gonna bite Randy, if it bites Randy tomorrow, he won't get dengue from it. It bites Randy a week after it bit me, he won't give it to him. It needs about two weeks in the mosquito before it can transmit. There aren't, Aedes aegypti females rarely live that long. Only a few percent of the females live that long. So if you could introduce this, wolf, this popcorn strain in and knock that tail of survival off, there wouldn't be any more dengue transmission. All right, that was his plan. Um, if it had been up to me, I wouldn't have funded it because I would have been sure the virus would evolve around it very quickly. <clears throat> it failed for a different reason, and the reason is that it had enough of a deleterious fitness effects in mosquitoes that they wouldn't be able to introduce it and get it to go. The unstable equilibrium I talked about was too high to actually get this to spread. And, but they were well into the project before they realized this, before they put in, but before the theorists like Michael Torelli and Nick Barton uh, said, no, this isn't going to work, it's not going to spread. About the time that they're finding out this is failing, they lucked onto something, all right? They'd been studying Wolbachia, actually, I guess Ashburner's lab had been studying them in flies, and they started discovering that some Wolbachia strains, not all of them, but some of them, actually block viruses. So in Drosophila, if that's the um, W. Mel strain, you put this Wolbachia into Drosophila and you try and infect the Drosophila with viruses that are otherwise kill Drosophila, they don't kill them. And then they discovered the same thing happened in mosquitoes. So, so 
The life shortening Wolbachia strain didn't have this property. It wasn't going to work, but they knew of other strains that were in theory block Wolbachia. I mean, sorry, block virus transmission. And so the plan then was very simple. We're just going to change over, forget about uh, the popcorn strain. We're just going to use a Wolbachia strain that is incompatible with virus transmission. And that's what they've done. And they've continued funding. They have successful introductions into Vietnam, Australia, maybe Singapore. They've started this in Rio. Um, they encountered one problem that they didn't anticipate once again, and that had to do with the fact that Wolbachia spreads very slowly in Aedes aegypti. I said that in Drosophila simulans, the spread was about 100 kilometers per year. In Aedes aegypti, it's about 200 meters per year, a fifth of a kilometer. Now, it's still, you know, you can establish it. It's just going to spread out very slowly. So what that meant is they had a lot more work to do. If you wanted to blanket a city like Phoenix, you might have to introduce it at high density to 100 or, I don't know, several hundred sites around the city. It's doable, but it's uh, a snag in, um, in their plans because they really hoped they could introduce this thing and it would just spread across the continent in a matter of a few years. That doesn't work. Um, the test case was Cairns, Australia. Right, this is O'Neill's home country. In 2010, there were something like a thousand dengue cases in Cairns. Most of those are secondary and tertiary infections. There's not endemic dengue in Cairns, right? But something like 50 people had come in with it from abroad. It spread to a thousand people, right? That was 2010. In the last three to four years, they've blanketed Cairns with these mosquitoes. They've had now something like 70 people come in with dengue. There has not been one secondary case from it. They have totally shut down dengue in Cairns. So if this thing is going to work, right, there's one issue that, that may come up. But if this is going to work, you can apply this worldwide. And you're talking about one of the biggest impact on healthcare we have seen since antibiotics or vaccines. It's absolutely profound. It came out from left field. The one unknown is whether dengue virus will evolve around Wolbachia. And that's totally up in the air. Um, they don't know what the mechanism is that Wolbachia uses to block virus transmission in the mosquito. Um, one idea is that it ups the mosquito immune system and that that's what's sort of suppressing the virus. Another thought is that just Wolbachia is physically occupying such a large part of some of the cells that there's nothing left for the virus to do in those cells. It's all guesswork, but this is the one question. If it doesn't evolve around it, I think we're looking at shutting down dengue, we're shutting down Zika, we're shutting down chikungunya. Um, now, there is the second species, Albopictus, that already it does transmit these viruses. Um, it's actually more widespread than Aedes aegypti. It already has two, two strains of Wolbachia in it. So those Wolbachia are not blocking viruses. But they know from the biology of this, they can introduce a third Wolbachia on top of the other two, cause it to spread the same way. So in theory, they can apply the same method to Albopictus they do to aegypti. So that's where it stands. Right now, it's looking like a resounding success. We aren't going to know if dengue virus is going to evolve around Wolbachia, I think, until we go into areas where um, dengue is endemic, right? Southeast Asia and that. Um, they're starting that. So in a few years, I think we're going to know whether the virus can evolve around it or not. But you know, I study virus evolution, and then I say there's no clear prediction which way this is going to go. Um, now, one downside of this is if dengue does evolve around Wolbachia, we don't really have a backup. There's no genetics of Wolbachia. You can't grow it in culture. It only grows in insect cells and that. And it's a total black box. They're just pulling this out of nature and hoping for the best. And we just, you know, so if the virus goes around it, um, it can keep going back to nature for more strains. But we don't really know. There's no way we're going to engineer Wolbachia at this point in time to fix the problem. Third story. Vaccine design, totally different now. It's just another real-time evolution story. This has to do with a virus called polio virus, which I suspect you've all heard about. Um, none of us in this room, I guess, are old enough to have actually 
seen people that get polio, but you might remember, well, I guess you're not young enough to remember, in the year 2000, they were talking about global polio eradication, right? We've had polio on the brink of eradication, polio virus on the brink of eradication for something like two decades. They were hoping to eradicate it. They set a goal of the year 2000. We're no closer now than we were then. Um, and a big part of the problem is evolution. So this is the, there are two polio vaccines, right? There's the one you get in the arm that's in an activated called the SALK. The other one is this one, the Sabin vaccine, also known as the oral polio vaccine. Um, and this is a thing that was used to bring the world close to um, eradication of polio virus. This is the live one. Um, <clears throat> And it was used in the U.S. up till about the year 2000 when they shifted over completely to the inactivated vaccine that's got its own problems. But the way this thing works is these are live viruses. They're genetically weakened, or we say attenuated, which means when we took them by mouth, we ate them. Polio virus, is, it infects the gut. That's the normal route of infection. Um, and the, the vaccine starts an infection in your gut. And, and you know, it, this goes on for a couple of weeks and your immune system eventually um, catches up with it, keeps you from getting sick. To get the disease, actually, it's not the infection in the gut that gives you disease. The virus jumps out of your gut, into your blood cells, and then into your central nervous system. And polio is, poliovirus was never terribly virulent. Of the wild type strains, there are three of them, right? Two of them, it was like one in a thousand people that got the, um, the wild type infection ever developed disease, and for uh, serotype one, it was one out of about a hundred, right? So the big problem with polio is you couldn't, you know, if you just counted on the people with diseases being the ones infected, you didn't have any idea what was going on. Okay, so back to evolution. When they developed this vaccine, which was in the 1950s, they didn't have any way of sequencing things. They didn't have any way of knowing how genetically weakened it was. They've since done sequencing, and they know that Sabin type 2 has only two attenuating mutations. Sabin type 3 has three attenuating mutations, and type 1 has a few more, right? So that's not very far from wild type, and we now know what happens is when you eat this thing, the vaccine strain it isn't going to give you disease. It starts, you know, it creates its own population in your gut, and that population starts evolving to undo these attenuating mutations. So within a week, you are secreting virus that has reverted at least some of these attenuating mutations, and maybe all of them. And you're excreting these things out in the environment, which means other people can get them. And they can potentially start their own epidemics. Now, the, the people that set this up, that developed the vaccine, understood all of this. And when they first went into a country to introduce this vaccine, they immunized as many people as quickly as they could, right, in a very short period of time. So I don't know if any of you in here are old enough to remember when they introduced this vaccine in the U.S., we had vaccine Sundays, right? Communities were announced in advance, we're going to be vaccinating. And this was even after we had the, the shot vaccine in place. They wanted everyone to get, you know, go to community centers and get vaccinated. And I still remember doing this at the local high school, right? So they did this to keep up herd immunity, which meant when you started excreting revertant virus, didn't have anywhere to go. But when you get to parts of the world where you don't have high vaccine coverage, this thing now can start spreading, right? If you don't have this herd immunity, these revertant viruses start spreading, they cause epidemics, they cause disease, <clears throat> and we now have circulating virulent poliovirus strains derived from the vaccine. Globally, we have eradicated wild type two poliovirus. But type two virus is still out there causing disease, it's just derived from the vaccine. Right, so that's kind of the backdrop here. And the big problem is we just, you know, there are parts of the world where you go in and try and vaccinate people and they tend to shoot you or do a worse to you. Um, so that's part of the problem. But the idea, the hope here is we'd like a new, a new vaccine. We want it to be live because you get better immunity from live vaccine uh, than you do from the killed one. And there's 
the whole set of problems with the killed one. We want it to be attenuated, so it should have low fitness, low virulence. The Sabin vaccine satisfies those, but we'd like no reversion. And the Sabin doesn't have that. And in 2006, so that's just over a decade ago, there were two papers published in the same issue of Journal of Virology by two different groups, Olin Q's group out of the CDC and Eckhard Vimmer's group um, out of Stony Brook. They proposed the same method of developing vaccines that would make them easy to design, uh, slow to revert, and we wouldn't even be changing their amino acid composition. And it's using a method called attenuation by silent codon changes. So just from uh, undergrad genetics, we know that because of redundancy in the genetic code, there's multiple genomic sequences, mRNA sequences, we can use to encode for the same protein. For the most part, um, so these are synonymous changes where they, we change the triplet codon, but we don't change the amino acid code for. Um, for the most part, these things don't have very big fitness effects, but some of them have at least mildly deleterious effects. And so the idea here in the plan is to, we're relying on the fact that these silent changes have small individual effects. We can choose them so they have small deleterious effects. We throw hundreds of them into the genome to attenuate quantitatively. And now if we got hundreds of changes of individually small effect, we should have very slow reversion, right? Because for evolution to undo this, it's got to undo all these changes we engineered into the genome. And that works more or less. This is a slide from Olin Q. Um, this is just not, there's no evolution here. This is just looking at the impact of the number of changes, number of engineered changes in the genome uh, on plaque area, which is a measure of fitness. We get this nice linear relationship that the more um, these are particular dinucleotide changes, but they're all non-coding changes. The amino acid sequence is the same. We see a very linear decline like that. I've done some work with the phage where we engineered the capsid. It's only 2% of the genome, made up to 50% codon changes. Again, no amino acid changes. The reason we don't want to change the amino acid sequence is we want the, our vaccine to be antigenically the same as the wild type, right? This method does it. Um, again, a nice linear decline with a fraction of preferred codons um, going down. We put in suboptimal codons in this case. And in this study, we actually did the evolutionary reversion. Um, wild type fitness up at this level. This is a log scale, and these are horrendously high fitnesses in this environment. I actually did a calculation once that if we had the Pacific Ocean for, filled with our host under these ideal conditions, this virus grows fast enough to wipe out all that bacteria in the Pacific Ocean in about three hours. Um, but our, we took the most extremely modified genome, starting fitness down here, Vavit for up to 100 generations, no significant increase in fitness. When we took it out to 1,000 uh, generations, we saw maybe 40% fitness recovery. This is the slowest adaptation we've ever seen in experimental evolution of this fade. So it looks like this principle, which was developed from first principles, works at least qualitatively, um, not necessarily as well as expected, but you know, nonetheless, just this, they pulled this out of their heads, I was going to say, but, um, but it does seem to work. So I think we can say that this method by silent codon changes, we have fixed the main problem with um, the Sabin vaccine. We, of course, are in a situation where polio is only confined to a few places left in the world, but I did find out that they're actually using one of these uh, silent codon attenuated viruses in some parts of the world right now. Whether, you know, we still have the problem that you can't eradicate polio unless you can get in there to vaccinate everyone. So we fixed one problem, but we haven't fixed the political problem. Those are the main three parts of the talk. I'll just show vignettes of some other uh, problems and what I consider to be real-time evolution. As far as I know, work hasn't been done on these. These are just teasers to say, you know, there's a whole suite of problems out there that I think are really exciting to work on. Um, this one concerns vaccines. So the new kid on the block with respect to um, vaccines is what are called recombinant vector vaccines, right? And Jeff working on cytomegalovirus, that's one of those 
So the idea with recombinant vector vaccines, which is only something you can do with genetic engineering, right? Couldn't do it in the old days, um, is you're taking one virus that you consider to be largely harmless and you leave it intact. You aren't taking anything out of its genome for the most part. And you're putting in some genes from a different virus, from a pathogenic virus, the one you want to make the vaccine against, right? And so you end up with this vaccine that is a fully functioning virus that happens to have a few extra antigens in it. So in this case, I think they um, put in antigens for influenza, but you can do all sorts of things. Uh, there's a recombinant vector vaccine that's, I think, going into phase one trials for HIV, right? It uses cytomegalovirus as the backbone. Cytomegalovirus is in, you know, probably in almost all of us. Um, it does cause problems in some cases. But so this is a new type of vaccine they're developing. Genetic engineering is made um, feasible. And there are various problems with them. They are live, right? They have to be alive pretty much to work. They are transmissible. They are hence evolvable. And the field has not even begun to come to grips with these two particular problems. CMV, by the way, what, even though all of us probably got it without incident, um, it causes, if a mother gets it while she's pregnant, it can cause microcephaly, and it causes, CMV causes more microcephaly than Zika does. Uh, in terms of ovability, we don't know whether, in fact, these viruses are stable or um, we have no idea what can happen. So that's one set of problems that's waiting for someone to analyze. Stem cells. Um, I was surprised to learn recently that stem cell industry is alive and well in this U.S. I don't know about well, but um, there are many companies. They're not regulated by the FDA, which is why there are so many companies. I think they're not regulated by the FDA because what they're doing is they're taking cells out of you and they're putting cells back in you. There is an evolutionary problem here because we've known for half a century that when you take cells out of something and put them in culture, which they have to do for some of these stem cell therapies, you're going to be selecting genetic changes the moment these cells get into culture. So you're going to be taking cells out of a person, evolving them in culture unknowingly, um, and then putting them back in. And we have no idea about the magnitude of that evolution or what the phenotypic consequences of it are. Right? Another problem. The last one has to do with gene therapy. So there is some gene therapy work being done, I think. Um, this is from Grant Trowbridge at Washington State University. But for some of these gene therapy trials, they take blood cells out of you, right, stem blood cells. They infect those blood cells with a kind of a defective retrovirus, which has the gene of interest that they're putting back in. But those defective retroviruses are jumping into the genome at all sorts of places. Some of them may jump in, you know, to activate a oncogene, they may jump into genes that are important in cell cycle checks, and he's realized that every implementation of this type of gene therapy is its own experiment in leukemia evolution, right? Because you're hitting all these cells, different places, and some of them are going to be act activating oncogenes, and you put them back in the body, and some of them are going to grow much faster than others. So. That's sort of an overview of what I consider to be, as I said, the most ex one of the most exciting areas in evolutionary biology, certainly at the interface of medicine. Um, there are lots of other problems out there. And, and when I think about where I started back in, I guess, 60s, early 70s as an evolutionary biology and where we've come today, it's just a really exciting time, I think, to be, to be an evolutionary biologist. Thank you. Mm. <clears throat> Lots to talk about here. We would like people to use the microphone when they ask a question. Yeah, on the first question, the, uh, <clears throat> you didn't mention the uh, extinction of mosquito strains. You didn't mention the potential ethical questions. That is, is it proper, is it permissible to make an effort to extinguish an entire species, even though it's a nasty bug like a mosquito, as this being discussed. Um, you're correct. I didn't mention it. I will leave that to everyone else. I will say in some cases that people are concerned from an ecosystem perspective of if you eradicate something that's been part of an ecosystem, what impact is it going to have? The defense, and I'm not offering the defense, but the defense that is offered 
is simply that in the case of the yellow fever mosquito and many of these other mosquitoes, these are all introduced into places. So Hawaii right now has a very serious problem of bird malaria where their species are, you know, a lot of species are going extinct because mosquitoes that weren't there to begin with are now transmitting malaria to the birds. And um, they had a meeting last September on this and the mosquitoes are introduced so they're not the least bit worried about wiping them out from the island, at least from the ecological perspective, because the mosquitoes weren't there historically. This is true of also the yellow fever mosquito. It came from Africa. You've got it here. I think Randy told me today um, we've got it in Austin and that it's an invader. So you, your ethical question of whether it's okay to eradicate a species, I suppose, still stands, but at least in terms of it's an invader and I come from Texas and, and <clears throat> with respect to the wild hogs that are running around the state that are invaders, we have no trouble wanting to eradicate them. So, <clears throat> yeah, Jeff? Use a microphone. So this uh, idea of induced silent changes in polio is, is a pretty interesting one, I think, but as the person who help develop lethal mutagenesis. I'm wondering if you really think that this is preferable to the normal way we think about it. I mean, you're introducing a bunch of weakly deleterious mutations and the population will undo them, right? It'll undo a few at a time and they'll be slightly more fit and those guys will undo a few at a time. Is this really better than just drug-induced, uh, you know, a drug-induced turnup of mutation rate and relying on the fact like we do in normal lethal mutagenesis or mutational meltdown that you have so many more deleterious coming in than beneficials that this will kind of take care of itself. Do you, do you well, think this the, idea is really going to work better than that? Um, so I'm still waiting to see lethal mutagenesis work in practice in a patient. Um, so that's a risk where he's referring to a method where you up the mutation rate of a virus and then hope that it dies out because the population is accumulating deleterious mutations. If we could do that, that would be fine. The defense here is as long as you can keep the so there's a basic reproductive number called R0. You've probably heard this in various courses, right? R0, which is essentially the birth rate of an infectious agent, has to be greater than one for it to take off in a population, right? If you were to say, knock R0 for the vaccine down to 0.5 or even less than that, and as long as the evolution is slow enough that it doesn't get above one, by the time it dies out, I don't think you have to worry. But that's the math talking. Jim. Uh, Jim, back to the suppressors. Yes. What, what, what do we know about engineering to suppress the suppressors? So that's Kevin Espelt's idea was yeah. he proposed. But is, uh, is, is, is anybody getting it to work? I mean, is, or Kevin's I know trying it. Um, I don't know if anyone's gotten it to work. It's actually a very interesting idea. The, idea the, the idea would be you'd introduce one drive system, a CRISPR drive system, to have an impact, but then you'd engineer a second drive system to go after the first, and so then they'd be playing kind of an, uh, an arms race. And um, it certainly would be something to try. The other thing is you might be able to engineer in something like a, a microRNA that you knew suppressed the CRISPR expression. So I think there are various ways to use engineering to, to make sure that you come up with the suppressors. But, you know, this is, um, I spent 20 years trying to predict evolution in systems with, which involve test tubes and bacteriophages that are well characterized. And I, I wouldn't put too much money on my ability to predict. So, um, you know, we're really, this, this is definitely a frontier. If we can get to the point where we can start predicting evolution in some of these things, that's, that will be huge, but <clears throat> so far I don't see it. So, yes, we can use in theory engineering to, to create some of the things to prevent extinctions, um, but whether they work in practice, I don't know. Done? Okay. Well, if you have other questions, come on up. So thank you. <clears throat>